All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar on NEC4 engineering and construction contracts, and in particular, how to deal with retentions within those contracts. Um, firstly, before getting too much further, I'd just like to say a few thanks to the people involved in this work. So um, hopefully, uh, shortly, we'll have Peter Higgins from NEC. Um, we're having a few technical difficulties getting him on the call at the moment, but uh, Peter's played a very important part in getting the guidance and hopefully he'll come on and be part of the webinar. And also uh, we have uh, Claire King from Fennec Elliott and Andrew Croft from Beale & Co who uh, have given their time up on behalf of CLC to develop this. So on behalf of CLC, a big thank you to all of them. And then also behind the scenes, we have Nicola Walters from BASE, who, although not part of the webinar, has been an important part of the development of the guidance. So, as I say, a very big thank you to all of them. Um, if you could go on to the next slide, please, Fahan. So just a little bit of background to this work. The uh, CLC, as many of you know, has a stated aim to see zero retentions, ideally by 2025. And there's a number of streams of activity ongoing at the moment to try to deliver on that. One of those is to work with the contracts bodies. So CLC approached NEC to ask how they could help. And working with Peter and his colleagues, the idea was to develop a guidance document. Based on the fact that NEC contracts uh, retentions are an option, the idea is really to give people a better feel for why you would want or not want to include a retention and provide a bit more guidance to that. But the subtext really being, you, you really shouldn't need them if certain things are done. So in essence, that's what the guidance document is all about. So what we want to do today is to talk you through that guidance in more detail, to give you the opportunity to ask a few questions and hopefully give you a better sense of when retentions are necessary in these NEC contracts. Before I hand over, uh, just a few practicalities with that in mind. I mentioned questions. You can see from the agenda there that we're going to take a panel discussion at the end. That's effectively a question session. So we're not going to pause at the end of each section. But if you think of a question and you want to register it, you'll see at the side of your screen, there's a facility to do so. So please do. Uh, get your questions flowing in. We'll be looking at them and uh, we'll bring them forward for panel discussion at the end. Any we don't answer, then hopefully we'll be able to get an answer to you separately. So please do get your questions in. Uh, we'll also be running some polls as we go through the, the webinar. The idea being to get a, a bit of a sense of what's going on now and hopefully at the end, whether the information has been of value to you. So please again, take part in that. It'll be pretty evident when it comes up on your screen how to do so. Okay, so with all the practice uh, practicalities rather completed, uh, I'm going to hand over now. As I said, we've got uh, a problem um, in the sense that Peter is first on or is due to be first on, but is having some technical difficulties and can't get on the call at the moment. But we are in very safe hands as we have both Claire and Andrew, and I think they're going to now split Peter's section between them. So hopefully we'll cover everything off that we need to do. And again, a big thank you to, to the two of them for stepping in and bailing us out from our technical challenges. So um, Claire, I believe I'm handing over to you for an introduction to the guidance. Um, thanks very much, Steve. I think we were going to carry out a poll um, on the use of um retentions in contracts so um if it's possible to get that on on the screen you are indeed right we are so Fahan, is it possible to put the poll question up yep the poll should be live now so if anyone can um answer that um right now okay Fahan, if you could tell us when maybe uh responses are slowing down so we know we've got a good representation that would be helpful okay so we've got 
the results in, I think, a good amount. Um, the yes, 79.1% answered yes to do you currently include cash retentions in your NEC3 or NEC4 contracts, um, and 20% or 20.9% answering no. Okay, that's lovely. So a big piece of work to be done by the looks of things. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll take a sounding at the end of the session to see if anything we've said has uh, enlighten you and maybe change your mind. As I say, the subtext of this really is to make sure retentions are only used if they're absolutely need to be. So uh, thank you for that. We've got a good benchmark to proceed with. And uh, Claire, over to you. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the guidance. Um, as Steve has already covered slightly, retentions are routinely used in construction contracts as security against unfinished or defective work. Um, they have become essentially a default option and quite often there is a little thought as to the true value or the need of, for those retentions. Um, and with that, I'm Peter, if you're online, I'm just going to hand over to you. I'm at bullet point two on your slide. Thank you, Claire. Um, sorry for the problems we've had. Um, for some reason, this machine didn't seem to want to let me in, but uh, we've managed to find a way. So hello and uh, nice to see you. Um, right, you're, you're, you've just done button number one, retention is routinely used. So I move on now to the, I mean, the pressure is there to use the industry moving towards zero retentions. That's that's a sort of a, an overall a, a objective in, in this country now, to try and get away from this holding retentions and, and uh, misusing it the way that it has been done in the past, trying to ease cash flow and get uh, better working relationships. Um, the idea of the guidance then really is to set out how, how retentions are used and, and when, you know, what, what the approach in NEC contract to using these retentions is, how they operate and set out wh when you can use retentions, how you use them and, and importantly, when you may not want to use them at all. So it's given a bit of guidance on those areas. So move, moving on to the next slide. I'll just run through how the NEC works with retentions, what its approach, what its general approach is. The starting point is that retentions are provided as an optional clause. It's not, it's not a clause which is there to be used as irrespective of whatever, simply because it's in the contract. It's, it's there so that people think about it and make a decision, a conscious decision that retention is needed. Don't do it because we always do, but because there's a reason for needing it. And, and allied to this, there are other provisions for security and it, it, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense to double up on security. If you've got one allowance of security in one place, do you need a second one to cover the same liability? So think about whether you actually need retention in the first place. That's the idea of having an optional clause rather than it being an automatic part of the contract. Now, retentions basically is there in order to uh, deal with unfinished work, defective work at completion. That's the main purpose of it. So thinking about what the NEC defines by way of completion. Um, it, it says that the contractor has got to do all the work that the scope states has to be done before completion. This means that the client and their advisor is in the position of setting out what they need to have finished. There's no such thing as practical completion. Um, it, it's, it's completion. You've identified everything that must be done by completion and the contractor has got to do that before they get their completion certificate. But also they must have corrected any defects in the work that would prevent the client's use of the work. So even though the work's finished, if there is a defect in it, which prevent the client from using it, then it's not completed. So there's a quite a strong test of completion in terms of how you can specify what's to be done and what the contractor must achieve before the work is finished. The whole point about that one is that the NEC approach there is that there should be very few remaining defects of completion. I'd add to that we have this process for correcting defects after completion within a def defined time. Now, if we move to the next slide, I can explain a little bit more about how this is dealt with under payment. If we have a price contract, the contractor is paid for completed work. Now, in the same way as completion is when the 
when the work doesn't have a defect which would stop the client using it. Similarly, completed work is work which has not only been finished, but it doesn't contain any defect, which in order to correct it would delay following work. So if there's something needs to be corrected, the defect in the work that's been done, and you can't get on with the next stage until that correction has been made, then that work has not been completed and it does not get paid for. So there's a strong incentive there on the contractor to pay for, get the work carried out without defect, or if there is a defect, correct it very, very quickly, get it sorted. Now, if you're on a target cost, reversible contract, target cost, target contract, there the contractors pay the defined cost, and that does include the cost of correcting defects generally. Now, it's causes of problems to some people who think we should be paying for correcting defects, but in fact, it's it would be prohibitive, prohibitively expensive to avoid it because you need a massive army of people watching over what's done to be able to spot the work and make sure you've recorded correctly the amount of time spent in correcting it. So it's an awkward thing to do anyway. But there are some restrictions on what is paid. I mean, firstly, it excludes the cost of correcting defects after completion. So again, another big pressure point onto making sure there are no defects after completion and that any, any defects that were in the work are corrected before completion. So the contractor is not going to get paid if there are defects need to be corrected after completion. So they will generally try very hard not to have any. There are some very limited other ground for disallowing payment, but these really just deal with um, where, where, where the contractors quite clearly and consciously gone against a very specific requirement for how the work's to be done. But you bear in mind, of course, that on a target cost contract, the contractor shares the cost of correcting through the target share. So whatever the cost of correcting a defect is, the contractor is paying part of that at least, depending on the, on the percentage share arrangement, which again is an incentive not to have the defect in the first place, or if the defect is found, to correct it as quickly and efficiently as possible. We do have a provision there for correcting defects after completion where they're not corrected. Contractor must pay the cost of correcting the defect if it's not corrected in the specified period. If it's not done within what's called the defects correction period, which will normally be a fairly short period of time, the contractor's got to pay the client for the cost the client will incur in correcting the defect itself. So that could be quite substantially more than the contractor would cost pay it cost the contractor in doing the same thing. So again, the contractor would want to correct it to avoid having a liability to pay a much more, much more substantial number. It's always possible the contractor and client can agree to leave the defect in the work and agree payment for it. That would be normally carried out normally during the contract period where it doesn't make sense to correct the defect because it's embedded in the work in some way and we can live with it in some way. Moving on to the next slide, just wanted to summarize the use of a retention fund under NEC. It's there to really, the main benefit is going to be, the main purpose is security cover the costs of rectifying defects after completion. There is, there is benefit there of rectifying defects before completion, but generally the contractor will finish the job and then correct the defects. Now, retention fund is of value if, there are significant defects outstanding at completion or significant defects arise following completion. But only if the client believes the contractor is not likely to correct them. If there are very few defects, if the contractor is one that the client is confident the contractor's likely to correct them, the, the, the retention fund offers no great benefit. Now, bearing in mind that whatever you ask for a, re a retention fund or any other security, there is a cost involved. The contractor must make some allowance for the cost of providing these, um, this fund to the client. There's a cash flow problem, You've got to borrow money from somewhere to lend it to the client. So you need to think about whether you really want it. If you can make appropriate procurement arrangements, choosing a sense of a contractor who's likely to want to finish the work, making sure that your contract clearly specifies what you want in the scope for completion and you manage the contract and the contract quality procedures well, 
there's a question mark as to whether you really need a retention fund. But anyway, that's that's the end of my section. I'm going to hand over to Andrew, I believe, who is going to give a bit more detail as to how the retention arrangement works. Thanks a lot, Peter. Yes, yeah, I'm now going to look at how NEC option X16, which provides for retention, works. Um, so as Peter mentioned, option X16 is a secondary option that NEC contract does not provide for a retention within the core clauses. If you want the contractor to provide a retention, you have to select X16 in the contract data. And that's a different approach to a number of other standard form construction contracts, such as the JCT, where the retention will apply it to all contracts. And it's just a case of putting the percentage in the contract particulars. Um, so why does the NEC take take that approach um as peter mentioned the retention is really intended to provide a resource of a pool of cash so that if there are uncorrected defects after completion um the client can use that to remedy or to reduce the cost or to contribute towards the cost of remedying defects um, and because of the way the NEC processes work they should mitigate significantly the risks of there being defects after completion and it's possible to manage the risk of defects out through those processes however that being said it's acknowledged that retentions are commonly included as we saw from the poll they're commonly included in construction contracts in the uk and there is a sometimes a commercial primarily a commercial reason for, for wanting them to be in there as it says on the slot on the on the quote from rudy klein on the slide um although there is there may be a commercial incentive Again, it's not something retention is not something that, that, that is necessary because of the way the NEC process works, it drives a, a right first time attitude. And there shouldn't, in theory, be non compliant work at completion. And if there is any, there, there's a mechanism to require the contractor to, to correct it. So before we move on to the next slide, just wanted to do an, a next poll, um, which was just to ask, um, obviously one of the downsides of including retention will be it impacts the contractor's cash flow. And as Peter mentioned, um, many contractors will attach a cost to providing a retention. And so the, the, the next poll we just wanted to flag was whether you would expect there to be an additional cost to providing works under an NEC contract if X16 is selected. Yeah, um, so the results have come in from do you expect tenders to increase their prices for providing a retention fund? Um, and we've got an 82% saying yes and about 17% um, saying no, or 17.8% saying no. Okay, that, 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 that's great. Um, I guess it'd be interesting if the question was phrased the other way around, I would, would it be a lower cost if there were no, 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 no X16 and whether that, that would be a slightly different answer, but I'm sure, I think we can assume that um, if we can, if the government can get to its target of having zero retentions, that will hopefully reduce the costs to some extent of of work, because there are there will never be be some additional cost where retention is is included. So moving on to the next slide, 
how does option X16 work? Um, X16 is, is included, and it is, as I said, to address that there will be some circumstances where you do need a retention under an NEC contract, primarily for commercial reasons, as I said. The, the reason for having X16 would be it provides a, a pool of, of cash which can be used if a contractor is unwilling to correct defects and it's I guess it may be an urgent defect um, but I think the primary reasons why you would want to include it, X16 would be if if you're potentially concerned about the solvency of the contractor so even even though you could use the mechanisms in the NEC to require them to remedy, then you'd be concerned that they refuse to do it. And you wouldn't be able to recover the costs you incur by them failing to do so. So primarily for solvency issues. Um, or also if, if as a client, you can't operate an effective quality management system during the works. As Claire will go on to, to look at, that in itself does not make an, a retention essential because there are alternatives that could be used to answer those questions. So yes, X16, it, it fills a, fills a gap and it, it may be useful, but it certainly shouldn't be the, the, the go-to option every time, unless you've considered all your, all the other options. So X16 is included in the ECC and the subcontract. Um, it's not included in the professional services contracts, as you would expect. Um, it's also not intended to be used with option F, which is the management um, option, because it's it's not appropriate when that option is used for the contractor to have sums retained to be used against defects. Um, one new aspect of retentions on NEC, which, which came with option NEC4 is that there is an option to require the contractor to provide or, or to accept a retention bond from the contractor as an alternative to deducting a percentage. Um, and, and that retention bond option would be um, a much more reasonable approach, although there may well be costs associated with it. And I'll go into that further in shortly on to the next slide so just briefly how does x16 work if it is used um so it will only use if it will only apply if x16 is marked to apply i.e it's stated to be an option in the contract data and then if it is marked to apply the client is then able to deduct or retain a proportion of the price for work done to date. And that proportion will be stated in the contract data as a percentage, as you typically see. And yeah, standard position would be 5%. Um, the NEC, unlike say the JCC option, it, it does allow or limit the impact of retention potentially by allowing a retention free amount to be stated. So you have a figure above which the retention is deducted and until the price of the work done today exceeds that amount, there will be no retention. So that does limit the impact of any retention if X16 is used. Um, another point worth noting is that the, the impact of X16 when it, when it is used um, it will very much depend on which NEC option is used and whether or not the contractor is subcontracting the work. Because if there's a lot of subcontracting, the, the, the NEC does not allow essentially um, double deduction of retention if options C and E are used because they're calculated, sub defined cost is based on gross payments made to subcontractors. And so if the contractors retain sums from a subcontractor, it can't then recover them upstream as well. 
And in terms of the release of the retention, 50% of the retention is released at the earlier of completion or when the client takes over the whole of the works and the remainder is included in the final, final amount due in accordance with clause 53. So on to the next slide, please. So in, I mentioned previously that NEC 4 X16 allows for a retention bond, essentially. And, and I'll now just look at how that operates. Essentially, um, the project manager has a decision as to whether or not to accept a retention bond if X16 is stated to apply and a valid reason for them not to accept a bond is essentially that the, 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 the bondsman or the bank or insurer is not strong enough to carry them. Uh, and, and essentially that is the only reason they can provide for refusing a bond without it being a compensation event. So if a bond is accepted for any other, it is rejected for any other reason, that will be a compensation event. I think that's now the end of my, my section and I'll hand over to Claire who will look at some of the alternatives. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, so the alternatives I'm going to cover now are broadly divided into two categories. So the first category is protecting the funds um, handed over as retention, different ways of doing that so that there's not a risk to them if there's an insolvency upstream or anywhere in the chain. Um, and the second category is security for performance, so alternative ways of getting cash if the contractor has decided that they're not going to come back to site to deal with the defects or they're out of the picture for some reason. So they're broadly divided into two, two categories. So I'm going to start with looking at category one, which is protecting retention funds um, and project bank accounts, um, which were looked as at an option in um, the 2017 government consultation, which um, gave some interesting sort of background to those as, as alternatives. Now, project bank accounts have been widely used in the public sector on, on big projects since 2007 and are still primarily used in that sector based on, on what seems to be available at the, um, by way of information on that to date. Um, and there was a headline last week, National Highways are now making um, project bank accounts effectively the default option on, on their projects to um, try and mitigate the risks of insolvency in the contractual chain. So option Y UK1 under the NEC4 provides for a project bank account to be set up and it's set up as a trust with payments made in from the client and sometimes the contractor and payments made out to the contractor and named suppliers who are the rest of the contractual chain and they can be added in later if they come later on in the picture um, in a, by way of a joining deed. Um, now, a trust deed is required on how this um, project bank account works, um, and it's linked to the payment mechanisms under the contract. So you've got to follow the procedures very carefully. But the monies are held on trust subject to the rules governing that trust, which gives some protection if somebody um, becomes insolvent in the chain. The monies are held in a, in a sort of protected um, fashion. Now, Historically, tier one contractors have argued that this increases the costs um, and that it does that because of the setup and administration costs. They've got to invest in the accounting finance system and invest in training. Now, to me, it appears obvious, but if once you're using these project bank accounts um, and if you get used to them, for example, on national high, highways projects, if you're doing that day in, day out, then obviously the costs associated with setting that system up are going to start to come down as people get used to it. Um, it's also really important that you set up um, to deal with interest and who is entitled to that. And under the um, option Y1.3 in the NEC4, um, whilst the contractor has to pay for any, any charges on that project bank account, they also get the interest and that neither of those count toward defined costs. Um, 
Now, previous studies have concluded that they're unsuitable for sector-wide alternatives to retentions, but it is clear that they are expanding their use in big projects, um, certainly in public projects. So it's definitely something to think about um, as an option, especially if you've got experience of them and you know how to use them and you've invested that cost in the first place. So next slide, please. In terms of other alternative um, ways, you can have trust accounts that are just limited to retention funds, um, which again, it ring fence that money and it's held in a separate fund. So you, especially in the current climate, hopefully the, the, the impact of insolvency and losing your retention funds, which is a big complaint and a big issue in the industry um, and costs a lot of money every year, it is, is mitigated. Um, now, again, you're going to have to clear, clear terms as to when those funds are released and what triggers that release. And based on my experience, what happens when there is an insolvency? Make it really, really clear how that works to avoid any disputes. But um, they are relatively low cost way of protecting funds. And they, although they haven't been used so much, or the data in 2017 showed they hadn't been very much use, it's, very, it's definitely a low cost way of trying to get some protection on those funds that should be thought about. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to security for performance, um, you've obviously got performance bonds, and that's quite a wide term that can cover a, a wide variety of different types of guarantees or on-demand bonds. So that has to be borne in mind um, when you say, I'm going to get a performance bond. Option X13 of the NEC4 provides this, and it's in the form that's set out in the scope. So obviously you need to be very clear about what is in the scope and what exact form you're going to have this performance bond in. So a performance bond protects an employer where there's been a breach by a contractor which results in losses. That sort of should go without saying. So it's, it's wider in a sense than retention. Um, if you have one of these in your project, then it could cover um, where where the contractor isn't coming back to, to or you need protection for the defects after completion. So it is an alternative. And there, are, as I said, there are various different types. They can be on demand or contingent. And that by I mean, if it's if it's a pure on demand form, you have to make you have to have a claim of the genuine belief in your claim and make a demand in the form required and payment should be made. Whilst if it's contingent, you have to prove that you've you've and or ascertain the loss in some way before you can make that claim. It's more like a true a guarantee. So it, it's very important that you understand what you're signing up to in terms of that form or what you're obliged to provide. Um, they do provide protection from insolvency um, because they're issued by a third party. Um, and they are widely used in the industry already, but generally in addition to retention in the industry. So as I think Peter said at the beginning, why not have that, if you think that's going to provide adequate protection, have that as your, your, your security for um, retention in, in, in place of it. Um, the costs have increased in recent years, and um, but I, I think they're stabilising now from what my colleagues tell me. So um, again, it's another option to think about. So moving to the next slide. A retention bond. Now, Andrew has already covered this in terms of option X 16.3. Um, it's it can be similar in form to a performance bond, but it's specifically linked to the retention monies and for dealing with the same sorts of issue. So defects emerging after completion or defects that still there at completion take over where you where you take over before everything's perhaps as it should be. Um, you can either procure it at the outset or during the project to get the retention released, and that's provided for in the option X16. Um, and obviously there will be an upfront cost because you're paying to get a retention bond from a third party that is acceptable, a bondsman that is acceptable to the employer. Um, but if it's only linked to retention, then it should, you would assume, be cheaper than a performance bond, which is for the wider, wider scope of contractual performance. Again, you need to be careful that the wording you have in your retention bond links it to the need for retention rather than wider breaches of contract or wider issues. Um, things to think about are timescales for claiming it, 
um, maximum amounts payable and how disputes are resolved if there's a, a debate as to whether that retention bond should have been called on or not. And we all know we have disputes about defects and whether they are defects after completion or not. Think about how that impacts on when you can call it or not. Now, again, the 2000 report did note they were expensive for small contractors and subcontractors, but they are an issue. They are um, something that should be considered for um, those that can afford them, have got good cash flow, and they 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 an upfront cost, but then you get your you don't have that deduction coming through every 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 month. So they are something to think about. And then finally, on the next slide, do my best Chris Whitty impression. And parent company guarantees, again, um, are another way of, of trying to secure performance to make sure that the contractor or the subcontractor will come back and fix anything if necessary. Um, option X4 provides for an ultimate holding company guarantee. Um, they are what they say on the tin. You are guaranteeing to undertake the subsidiary's obligations or pay damages or losses or costs if they don't deal with the defects, um, perhaps because they've gone insolvent. Um, Sounds obvious, but the company needs to have a parent to issue a parent company guarantee. And the parent company also needs to have assets. Um, you might also want to think about where the parent company is located. Um, I've had offshore um, parent company guarantees and they have, it's quite, it's not as transparent as the onshore corporate structures are or the accounting procedures. So you need to be able to work out how you make a claim in those sort of circumstances. Um, depending on the drafting, and again, everything comes down to the drafting specifically, it can take time to claim under a PCG. Um, exactly how long it will take will depend on the wording and how that interacts with the main contract, but also what form of dispute resolution is provided for. So some forms you might have to get right to the end of the final account under the main contract before you can make a claim. Some adjudication um, company guarantees if you've got that sort of thing you might be able to claim at an earlier stage so all all these options need to be thought about if you want to get um, um happy with having this as a replacement but it, it is an option particularly if companies have um well-off parent companies and it may very well reduce that improve the cash flow significantly um if you can get one so I think those were the main options I was going to cover that are all covered in the 2017 consultation. Um, so I think next slide, please, or any questions? Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, there's just a little bit of information there about the NEC Community Act for people to take on board and get more information. Um, but you'll remember at the beginning on our agenda, uh, we said we'd have a panel discussion, which was in effect an opportunity for people to ask questions. So um, let me have a look in the questions box that are coming in. And uh, just to give advance warning to our panelists, I'm going to be looking for someone to take these. So. I'd rather me point at you if somebody wants to volunteer, might be uh, more accurate in person to the right person. So uh, first one, we have one in and I'll, it's quite a long question. So bear with me while I read it. Uh, it says, in my experience where there is no retention, contractor performance has been substantially worse than where there is a retention pot. This is on contracts that have been ma managed effectively with suitable quality management systems over the course of the works. Eliminating retention appears to be a triumph of theory over reality of the commercial incentives. The client will end up paying more to consultants to chase the contractors unwilling to perform. That will equal any reduced cost payable to the contractor for the retention pot during procurement. So apologies for uh, the length of the question, but hopefully you've got the context. So what's being said here is if you don't have a retention pot, then you're going to likely to get uh, a lesser quality job. So would anybody like to take that one? Stun silence. Peter, I, I think I can see you moving, but you're on mute. Yeah, no, so I've, I've turned the machine, I've turned my microphone back off. The, prob the problem with this one is the, the uh, attending questions were hiding the microphone, but never mind. I'm, I'm quite happy to start with this one anyway. I'm sure others will have contribution. Um, one of the things that always puzzles me with this kind of argument is that um, the reason you put retentions in is because you think the contractor's not going to perform. And, and 
that somehow has turned into the case that if you don't have the retentions in, the contractor will not perform. I'm, I'm a bit puzzled about that because it's almost like uh, which comes first? Is, are, are you have a, do you have a contractor who's unlikely to perform and therefore you should need retention? Or are you saying we have a contractor who would normally be quite happy to, re, to, to perform properly, but because you have no retentions in, we're not going to bother. We're, we're, we're just not bother performing. I, 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 bit, bit, amused about that. I would have thought that if the contractor is one who is reliable in, in terms of whether they're going to perform their obligations, whether or not the retention on there, should, I would have thought they would turn around and say, well, normally I would, but this time because there's no retention, I don't need to bother. I'll, I'll not do it. So I, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, be, be interested in what other people's experiences. Um, I'm just a little bit puzzled by the, the concept. Claire, Andrew, anything um, to add to this? I think it sounds like, I mean, everybody's had bad experiences. <laughs> um, but I think if you look at some of the options, um, they would provide sticks, as it were, to get somebody back. Maybe if you had those, I don't know if this particular project did, that would be another way of getting them back without holding on to the retention. Um, yeah, yeah so I... for example, a PCG, for example. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I, I agree with both both of you and I, I think the the other point would be as as peter mentioned in his his section of of the talk um there are embedded in the nec payment processes depend it's slightly different depending on which option but there are sticks in there you can use to manage performance so you if work is defective you don't pay for it or you reduce the sum you reflect that in the assessment of of, of sums that are due rather than just deducting a 10%, 5% every time, just in case it might be defective. So, so it's trying to, it would be trying to administer payment a bit more robustly if you're worried about a contract not performing. Okay, thank you both. Uh, maybe just to add a, a specialist perspective to this as that's my uh, sort of day job. Um, if you look at the PyTate research, I think something like 50% or more of contractors have said they've lost money to uh, non-payment. Um, and that worsens as you go down the tier. So tier two onwards, that situation gets worse. So there's a, a presumption in many cases that they're not going to get paid or going to get paid something that uh, is less than they think they're entitled to or take longer or, or whatever. So in, inevitably, steps are taken to mitigate against that because that, that would be their margin tied up in that project. Um, that mitigation will often take the form of something that would reduce quality. So it would seem um, you know, fairly logical that in a number of cases, you are likely to get a lesser quality output, uh, ironically, from holding a retention. And that, that can't be specific. That research isn't specific to NEC. That's a generalization around retentions. Um, but it's not something that is envisaged to lead towards a quality job. In fact, it can be seen to have the reverse impact. Okay, I'll move on to another question. Um, uh, as the NEC recognizes well, uh, actually this is from the same person, as the NEC recognizes well, collaborative working is only possible with the correct commercial incentives. Use of clause 46 is significantly weakened without a pot of money. So it's, not all, it's also not a commercial incentive. Not sure where else commercial incentive to correct defects post-completion might arise from. That may well have been uh, at least in part answered in the last discussion, but is there anything anyone would like to add in response to that question? Peter? Oh, sorry, Claire? I was just going to say, I mean, the ultimate recourse is to take proceedings against somebody if they're really, if, you know, if you've got high value defects that are outstanding, um, you know, there is there are remedies there. <laughs> Um, and, but I think the general point is there are options in there for securing performance. It sounds like um, there's been a bad experience in this particular case. I was going to say, it's, it's a very similar point, really, that um, <clears throat> without retention, the concern but, that um, Michelle has is that the, the incentive to the contractor to perform isn't there. So why would they bother performing? It's the same sort of point, really. I think. Uh, it, it, it's got to be questionable whether you, you actually do need this kind of leverage over a contractor to make them perform. And, and I find, you know, it's, it's 
you know, a little bit sad that we have an industry which says that the contractor will only perform well if you've got a very, very big stick to hit him with when he doesn't. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to some other questions. Um, there's one uh, that asks, is, is there any data available to show how much brackets and how often retention is used when assessing the cost of the to the client of uncorrected defects? Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe Peter, in a second, you can give us something if there's anything specific to NEC. I think um, obviously earlier we took a, a poll as to <laughs> how often this used. We had 79% of contracts. If you look at the Pi Tate research, I think the figure is around 78 which is remarkably consistent. So I think it's reasonable to say that's how much uh, retention is used. Um, when a, okay. when, it, when it's, in, uh, that's how much it's actually used. In terms of how it's uh, used when assessing the cost to the client, Peter, I think that's what you're gonna go on to answer. Well, what, what I was gonna say, I draw a distinction between use of retention and collection of retention. Um, collection, often, I think my experience is that retention is frequently collected and very rarely used. Um, I, I've been working on a number of schemes, really on the major, major highway, a lot of it, major major works. Um, I can't remember one where actually the client had to use retention because the contractor refused to do the work. And I think that's the, that's the point about the question. Um, the cost of the client of uncorrected defects, uh, how often the retention is used for that? And I, 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 my experience is there haven't been cases, but I'm sure that uh, the lawyers will probably have a lot more cases where they find that they're, they're having to collect money. Claire, Andrew, any response to that? I have a lot of experience where people aren't paid the retentions when they ought to have been at the end of the job, when there's very little left for people to refuse to pay it over and they still surprisingly find a reason not to. Yeah, I think I, I would share that that, that experience. I, I, I guess it's, it's not something that I think is ever completely black and white where retention is used or where, where money is essentially permanently retained because of defects. Um, it's something that normally just comes out through the final account calculation. Uh, and it's not so much a case of the client saying, I'm going to take this money and spend it on the contractor that, that they would just deduct a specific amount from what's due in the final account. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, moving on to another question. Uh, we have one here. It says, I work client side and I have found recently that when we have offered zero retention to the main contractor, the main contractor has still had retention clauses in their subcontracts down the supply chain. How are NEC lobbying main contractors on this to drive improvements required? Maybe a question for you initially, Peter, but I'm sure there'll be other views. Yeah, I mean, NEC itself has no no real strength in lobbying contractors. Um, what we do is to put all sorts of guidance and advice out to, to the industry and through our user group, try to educate people into the sensible way to manage contracts. Certainly, um, one of the clients I worked with had a very clear statement that they would not collect retention on from the contractor. But if the contractor took any retention from their subcontractors, they had to hand it over to the client. Um, the, 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 the intention was not to have any retention at all, but it's very hard for anybody to stop retentions if a contractor or a client wishes to withhold them. Um, so, I mean, a simple answer to this, how are we lobbying main contractors? I, de I don't think we are. What we're trying to do is to educate the industry rather than lobbying any, any particular part of it. I suppose there's nothing stopping you having an express contractual term that says you will not have any retentions in your subcontract. That might be another way of um, trying to ensure that if that's what you want as a client. Then yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a good point. And, and then you, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of contracts will say, I think maybe even the NEC re requires the the contract to be approved by the client, mm -hmm. un unless it's an NEC form, effectively. Um, and so you can, it will take a, a additional administration, but you can ask your contractors to provide the subcontracts to, to, to show that I, I mean effectively I, 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 clearly we, we can't force everybody to behave in the way we want them to and there will always be unfortunately practices 
in the industry, which not everyone will agree with. Um, but I think all, all we can do is try and encourage a move away from retentions. And I think it, from my experience, you see it over and over again, a project where the contractor's re retention has been withheld. So the contractor then refuses to pay subcontractors and consultants, and then it ends up resulting, ends up being allegations of defects around the team as an excuse to withhold payments. And it, it just has that knock on effect. Uh, obviously, we, we, we won't guarantee that we get rid of that by removing retentions, but it's just trying to avoid triggers for that sort of behaviour. Okay, thank you both. And it sounds like the uh, clause by the client might be a very sensible way forward. Um, yeah. Moving on, um, is there a case for excluding X16 under target cost contracts on the basis that PWDD is prospective? So hopefully that means something to you, Peter. I think it does, yes. Um, what happens is that the project manager um, certifies payment of the amount that he concludes the believes that the contractor will pay um, in the next within the next um, uh, period of time. So it, it is prospective in as much as the contractor will not have paid it, but the contractor will have put in an application saying that this is the amount I'm going to pay, and therefore uh, that would include retention if that's being held in some way. Um, as to excluding it, we, we can, I think the argument for excluding it is the same whatever the contract. The, 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 one of the benefits of a target cost is that if the contractor is holding retention, then that, that is, um, sorry, I'm, I'm bumbling, going, up, going off the message now. I mean, go back to the message. Um, if, if the, the um, retention is identified in the contractor's application, then the project manager will take account of that in certifying payment. If there is no retention in the contractor's application, the project manager would not hold retention. But if the contractor then subsequently deducts retention, he would have put in a false application. And the project manager would need to take account of that in future certification, knowing that the contractor is providing wrong information. So I, I think the fact that it's prospective doesn't make a difference. It's just a question of whether it's a sensible thing to have. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and we'll take one more uh, before we do the last poll. Uh, and I guess it's it's more of an idea, but we all need a response. It says option X16 provides for a retention free amount. Although there is no upper limit, what about adding a retentions cap to limit the total retentions amount deducted? Anybody got a view on that? So a figure as such, rather than a percentage, is that what you're saying? Uh, so would you like me to read it again? Or... Option X16 provides for a retention-free amount, although there is no upper limit. So what about adding a retentions cap? Um, I guess it would be in whatever uh, the retention-free amount is. Is that a figure, Peter, or a percentage? No, I think I think probably it's two different things here. The retention free amount is the amount the the contractor is paid um, for working on the site before any retention is taken. So you're then taking a percentage of what's left. And I think is the question here about a retention cap to limit the total retentions deducted is saying that while it's a percentage, if the price of the work goes up, the amount of retention would increase over and above that expected tender. So should we have a cap on that as well? Um, I mean, we don't have one at the moment in the NEC, but I guess it would be a fairly simple matter to specify that the retention fund is, should we say, 3% up to a maximum of so much. Yeah, we yeah, have yeah. contract data. Yeah, or you just make clear it's 3% of the, yeah, a maximum of 3% of the price that, including in, in the tender or, 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 the, or the price of the date of the contract rather than it being a moving feast. Yeah. Okay, so something to consider, maybe. Okay, I think we, we've run out of time to take all the questions, but we will endeavour to try to get some answers to the questions separately, uh, if that's possible, and respond to people directly. Um, just to finish this off, we said we had a third poll question. So, Fahan, if you could put up the question, please. Uh, 
And again, if you could let me know when you think we've got all of the answers. Um, and the yeah. scores on the doors. So um, the poll results have been in. We've got 73.3% answering yes um, to are you likely to recommend that a retention fund should be unnecessary. Um, yeah, and 26.7% uh, mm -hmm. responding no. Well, Steve, I think we can't. Oh, oh I'm so right. I've put myself on mute. My apologies. For that. <laughs> uh, what I was saying was there's some success that, uh, from that, that survey. So that's encouraging. But there are also a number of uh, practical questions that are coming up in the chat around is the guidance available? Can they have the slides, et cetera? Uh, just to reinforce, the guidance actually has been out for quite a while now and is accessible. So people can access it. We would obviously encourage you to do so. Um, in terms of the slides, I think we're happy and looking around the screen for them to be provided to people yeah. after the event. Yeah. So uh, no problem there. And as I said, we'll um, we'll endeavor to see if we can answer some of the questions that we haven't unfortunately had the time to respond to. Um, there's a slide come up on the screen here. So I'm not, uh, is anybody going to comment on that? Yeah. It's not I can um, take over for this, but yeah, there's, there is a um, new training course available on the NEC website if anyone is interested in getting a, their project manager accreditation. Um, we've introduced a new format, which is a blended format. So 30 hours of online learning and a one day tutor led um, consolidation session. So if people couldn't commit fully to the tutor led sessions, but still wanted that experience, you can have that with our new blended format, um, which is available on our website. Okay, thank you, Farhan. Okay, uh, well, sorry to, to bring it to a close with a number of questions left, but hopefully uh, you found the webinar to be valuable. And certainly the score at the end would indicate that a number of people are now considering um, whether retentions are needed, maybe in cases where they have been used before, which was our intention. Uh, support is available, continue to read the guidance. Uh, I'm sure NEC will support any further questions directly. And of course, if you're looking for more professional support, then you can always approach Andrew and Claire, who can uh, give you uh, that support, but obviously in a, in a professional capacity. As far as CLC are concerned, we're going to continue to work on uh, retentions in, in various forms, and hopefully we'll continue this relationship with NEC, which has proved fruitful for us in a number of areas. And we'll also be working with a number of other the contract bodies to try to get them to do something uh, likewise. So um, unless any of my uh, fellow panel members have anything to add, I'm just looking around the screen as I talk to you. I'll thank you all for taking part in the webinar and uh, wish you all well for the rest of the day. Right, thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.